MCs can start the program now. Yes. Good evening. A gentle reminder to kindly mute yourselves during the session. The capacity to learn is a gift. The ability to learn is a skill and the willingness to learn is a choice. A very good evening to one and all present here. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to Retrace Expedia, hosted by the Anur Alumni Association. Myself, Dr. Anjana Thomas, senior lecturer from the Department of Prostodontics and a proud alumni of Anur Dandur College, and Dr. Justin James, senior lecturer from the Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, will be the host for the day. So to start with, a word of prayer and gratitude in mind, body, and spirit as we praise and thank God Almighty for all his graces showered upon us during these tough times of the pandemic. Moving on to the much awaited talk of the day, when to have wisdom, a tale of wisdom tooth removal, which is the first CD program in the series of Retrace Expedia after the International Conference Retrace conducted by the Anu Alumni Association, which is a platform for knowledge exchange, thereby promoting the upliftment of an individual as a team. This provides us with a golden opportunity for pragmatic learning from renewed faculties. Because here in Anu, we believe that learning is not a destination, but a never ending continuous process. This belief of Anurians have paved the way from numerous accolades over the passing years that is College of the Year 2019 by the Higher Education Review magazine. We are 22nd among the best private dental colleges in India as per the Week Hansa survey. We also take pride in announcing our recent achievement of being accredited with a V++ grade by the National Assessment and Accreditation Council, that is a NAC, which is the highest grade for a standalone dental institution in India. Our students are recipients for various funded research projects under the ICMR, the Kerala State Council of Science and Technology, and also the Tata Trust Scholarships. So here, we present before you our institution with utmost pride and dignity. So let us look at the proud journey of Anu so far. History has proven, history has proven that those who dare to imagine the impossible are the ones who break all the human limitations.
nothing can be reassuring and heartwarming than the affectionate words of welcoming. So let us lend our ears to Dr. Sneha Kurian, an alumni of 2006 batch, who is currently working as a medical officer for Reliance General Insurance. We welcome you, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. With great honor and pleasure, I, Dr. Sneha Kurian, alumni 2006 batch, welcome you all and express my heartfelt gratitude for sparing your valuable time to be with us this evening. As already described by Dr. Anjana and Dr. Jessly, Retrace Expedient will be a series of knowledge sharing and learning experiences conducted by the Anur Alumni Association. I extend a warm welcome to our Administrative Chairman, Advocate T.S. Rashid, and Director Mr. T.S. Binyamin on behalf of everyone present here today. I cordially invite the Principal of our College, Dr. Jiju George, and Vice Principal, Dr. Lisa George, to this session. I heartily welcome our Students Dean, Dr. Joe Paul, to this session. I sincerely welcome the President of the Anur Alumni Association, Dr. Deepak Thomas, and our Secretary, Dr. Ronan Sebastian. I am elated to welcome our speaker for the day, my batchmate and friend, Dr. Mithilesh Kardenbo. I am glad to welcome our moderator for the day, Dr. Eldos George. Thank you once again to everyone for your valuable presence today. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. At this juncture, may I now invite Dr. Ronan Sebastian, Senior Lecturer from the Department of Periodontics and Secretary to the Anur Alumni Association to proudly introduce Dr. Mithilesh Karanto to be the distinguished speaker of the day. Good evening, one and all. I'm glad to introduce you our speaker of the day, Dr. Mithilesh Karanto. He is from 2006 batch, an alumni of our prestigious college. He is my batchmate and a very close friend of me. I have always admired his skills from our college days. Academically brilliant, a true artist and a sports person. There is no field that he hasn't excelled in, from fashion shows to dramas. These pictures will show his photography skills. To prove his artistic skill, he is the designer of our alumni logo, retrace logo, and later the retrace expedient logo. He was the editor-in-chief of our first college magazine in the year 2008 named Reflection. So this is the launching ceremony of Reflection with the then union chairman, Dr. Deepak Thomas. And on his academic brilliance, he completed his PG in OMFS from Calicut Government College in the year 2017 with first rank in Kuhas University. To add upon his academics, he published several national and international publications related to maxillofacial surgery. He has worked as a senior resident in Government Medical College Manchuri in the year 2017. He has currently moved to the prestigious Maulana Asad Institute of Dental Science, Delhi, as a senior resident. He is also a successful implantologist. If I keep on expanding his merit in various fields, it will take me hours to dig in. So let me conclude welcoming Dr. Midilesh Karando. Please lead your attention. Good luck, brother. May I now wholeheartedly invite a most prolific personality, Dr. Eldos K. George, head of the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, to be the moderator of the session. We welcome you, sir. And thank you, Dr. Ronin, sir. So here, before we begin, here's a gentle reminder. Any queries and doubts regarding the session or the topic can be posted in the chat box and it shall be discussed later after the session. So without much ado, let us begin. Over to you, Dr. Mithilesh, sir. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Dr. Ronin, your introduction was too much to handle. You brought back so many memories to me. Actually, your words are humbled. In fact, the leadership shown by Dr. Deepak and Dr. Ronin under the guidance of Jiji sir and the administration, including TS, uh, uh, Rishi sir and Binyamin sir, have made the AAA into an elegant association. So because of that, I got a chance uh, to present here. Like, I feel very grateful and privileged to sit here in front of this laptop presenting 
and doing this session because I got a chance to present in front of all my mentors, all my inspiration and role models, especially when Eldosar is chairing this session because he is one of my inspiration to take up surgery as a speciality. I still call him when, to discuss cases, especially when I have complications, I still call him. And I still remember the day when uh, Sumeri ma'am handed me my first extraction case. It was a 2-6. And the way she told me to pull the tooth buckley and occlusion, that voice still rings in my head whenever I do it. Upper molar, and even I tell my juniors to do the exactly the same, and it always works. Anyway, we'll cut to the chase and we'll move on to our uh, topic of discussion that is when to have wisdom, a tale of wisdom tooth tomorrow, right? So, I intend to discuss more about the assessment of the impacted tooth rather than the surgical part. So, what I mean here is by the end of the session, I hope some of you guys will be able to decide when to take up a surgery rather than and when not to take up a surgery. All right. So we will begin with the case. Okay. So one day you are sitting in your clinic and one young adult patient comes to your clinic with a toothache, with a chief complaint of toothache in the lower right low, uh, back region of the jaw. And uh, and you see the patient clinically. So you see there is a fully erupted tooth, the recent uh, uh, pericoronal uh, infection or pericoronitis, but that tooth is fully erupted. And it's the, it looks very promising and it's sitting there looking at you like you can do this. And you are also confident, yeah, this is a erupted tooth. And the patient is a young adult. What can go wrong, right? So you tell the, assure the patient that this is a piece of cake. This is a simple case. The case will be finished in few minutes. So you will send your assistant or maybe you will itself will go and fetch your instruments. The basic extraction set. Most probably it includes the periosteal elevator, a mold number nine, a London based uh, straight elevator and any uh, forceps of your choice. Okay. So you reflect the flap with the periosteal elevator and uh, with the periosteal elevator and uh, you start reflecting, uh, elevating the tooth. Okay. You reflect, you start elevating the tooth. Then you understand the tooth is not moving. You try again, not moving. You try again with forceps, the tooth is not moving. You look at the patient, patient looks at you. You look at the assistant, assistant looks at you. Then you will ask the assistant to bring another instrument. It will be a narrow straight elevator or a cryos elevator. Whenever I get stuck, I don't know why, this scene always runs in my head. <laughs> the comedy scene in Vilayanush uh, Nadu, made legendary by Kudiravattam Prabhu. Most of the Palayadis will be doing this, right? <laughs> you will be constantly assuring the patient that this is a piece of cake and you will uh, remove the tooth in a few minutes. Uh, while in your head, it will be like, why the hell did I take up this case? I feel like I don't know what to do right now. You will uh, ask the assistant to bring the instruments till all the instruments in your inventory is over. And still you don't stop the, after one or two hours of struggle, which feels like one eternity later, you will accept the tooth that it's a bloody battle and I'm stuck. And still, if you don't stop, that bloody battle is going to get very bad, right? So if your day is good, you'll end up with a fractured tooth. If your day is bad, you'll end up with several complications like instrument breakage, displacement of the tooth root into the submandibular space and the pterygomandibular space. And if your day is very, very bad, iatrogenic mandibular fracture and the, all these complications can be very troublesome and even the patient can sue you and give you lots of sleepless nights, give you lots of sleepless week, right? So what went wrong here? We may be thinking about so many reasons, like it can be all the confidence of the patient, uh, of the dentist, it can be because of inexperience of the dentist, but I won't say that because even the senior surgeon, senior uh, dentist, get stuck in there, right? 
So we cannot say it's inexperience or over confidence. Uh, in my opinion, the root cause of all this is misdiagnosis. The dentist was not able to correctly diagnose the case and implement a proper treatment plan. The dentist could have taken some other imaging or something to properly access the uh, difficulty of the case and must have prepared nicely and educated the patient of probable consequences also. So, uh, but for lucky for the patient in an alternate universe, the dentist was more observant. He noticed there was a soft tissue covering just distal to the erupted uh, third molar and he advised the patient to take an OPG. Okay. So when he took the OPG, he saw that this tooth is a distoagular impacted tooth. It's some anomaly in the root area. And the nerve is also very good. So he, ex he expected some sort of difficulty and he arranged all the proper instruments, including the periosteal elevators, forceps, everything, straight elevator, foot bone cutting, and everything, and even informed the patient about the probable complication you may have to expect, including the swelling, pain, and nerve paresthesia. And he did a proper procedure by minimal bone guttering and took the tooth out. After taking the tooth out, he found that the anomaly in the radiograph was because of a triple rooted mandibular third mole. Okay, so he did this procedure with minimal tra trauma to the tissues because the bone belonged to the patient and tooth belongs to the surgeon. It's like that he, uh, when uh, you respect the bone tissue and you respect the soft tissue, these tissues respect you as a surgeon. So the procedure will be very atraumatic. And the post-operative period likewise will be very uh, uneventful and the patient will be also happy. So how did this dentist in this alternate universe accepted the case and assess the case correctly to, to a procedure? So whenever a challenge comes to you, we begin by identifying the challenge and defining the challenge. Then we make the plan we do the assessment and plan and implement that plan. So every challenge begins with identifying and definition. So we know the identity is a third molar. So how is this impacted third molar defined? There are numerous uh, definitions for uh, third molar impaction. One is Lytle in 1971. He defined impacted tooth as the one that have failed to erupt into the normal functional position beyond the time usually expected for such repair. In case of third molar, it is 18 to 21 years. So after 21 years or 22 years, we can officially call it to the third molar and back to it. Okay. So what are the indications for removal? It, any the indication is to remove pain, to elevate pain. One of the most common reason for disimpaction of third molar is pericornitis. It can do, be to prevent the dental caries. It can be to prevent root absorption if there is some other pathology below the impacted tooth, like cyst or tumors, especially dentigerous cyst. And for unexplained origin, maybe when the patient comes with a neurogenic pain, like trigeminal neurology, and if we see an impacted tooth, we may ask the patient to remove the tooth just to rule out one cause. Okay. Sometimes we can use this impacted tooth to uh, auto transplant into the second molar. Maybe for prosthetic and orthodontic concentration. And before orthognathic surgery also, like in BSSO, the cuts come through the uh, uh, impacted third molar region. So we usually remove the third molar and wait for some six months to do the major surgery. And it can be for prophylactic reason also, like patient going undergoing RT, uh, radiotherapy and chemotherapy. So, so rather than the indication, we should know about the contraindication. Before you start the procedure, we should assess the patient, clinically assess the patient and make sure the patient doesn't have any medical compromised stage, some comorbidities. If the patient is diabetic or not, if the patient is taking some uh, uh, blood thinners. So in that case, we have to identify the risk and send the patient to the uh, medical side to get a consultation and fitness. Okay, You should not do the uh, case if uh, there is excessive risk to the damage of the adhesion structures. If the uh, future of second molar is compromised, like if you are intending to remove the second molar, this third molar can act as a retention for future FPD. And 
uncontrolled infection, we shouldn't go and drill the bone because it can lead to osteomyelitis. And probably a fra probability of fracture of uh, mandible is the like in atrophic cases, old age patients. And major no no, absolute contraindication is vascular malformation associated, associated with the uh, uh, mandibular uh, side. Like if you see a bruise, you feel a bruise, and all, you don't do it. So we now know the indications and contraindications. So how do you assess this impact group? Okay. So it begins with clinical assessment. Clinical assessment will be in two stages. One will be the general assessment and the local assessment. General assessment include age, medical history, systemic condition, and any allergic history. Age, because in old age patients, the healing will be slower and we can make the procedure difficult. In local assessment, we have to see if the patient is having mouth open. You are maybe knowing that no major reason for masticatory space infection is uh, because of the impacted turn model. So what happens is if the patient is having Christmas, you'll, you cannot take the tooth out because this tooth is already inside the bone. How will you take out the uh, tooth if the patient is not able to? Uh, open the mouth. So we'll have to uh, get the mouth opening back, then only do the procedure. Then we have to check the eruption status of the molar, resorption associated, pericoronitis, orthodontic and prosthodontic con uh, concentration, and also of the soft tissue. The soft tissue is one part that we all miss, like the size of tongue, accessibility of the lips and cheeks. What happens is when an obese patient, especially when the obese patient comes, there is a chance that when you do the flap, reflect the flap, and you see the case, this tongue or this cheek, chubby cheek, will always come into the surgical field and will be a big menace and will make the procedure very difficult. So these are things that you should check during the clinical assessment. And then there is this classification. We know that there is an impact. So there should be a classification also, right, to make the procedures easier to find out which is easier, which is difficult. So there are so many classifications, the simplest one, based on state of eruption, it is erupted, partially erupted, and unerupted. And then there is, uh, uh, depending on the nature of overlying tissue, it can be complete bony, partial bony, or soft tissue uh, impaction. And this soft tissue impaction is uh, one of the easiest case to deal with, okay? And uh, there is this classical classification article. It was put forward by George Winters in 1926. What he did was he classified the impacted third molars with respect to the long axis of the second molar. And he uh, called them by several names. That is one is vertical, which is parallel to the long axis of the second molar. Then there is mesial angular, which is in a mesial tilt, horizontal, it's like a sleeping tooth, and distal angular with a distal tilt, then buccolingual and others, which include inverted. So there was a dilemma between identifying between mesial angular and horizontal. So the future researchers, the authors, newer authors, put a number to this. Made gave an angle at which we can call specific tooth as mesial angular and some tooth as horizontal. It is if the angle between the long axis and the long axis of the second uh, third molar is between 10 to 79 degree, it is mesial angular. If it's more than 80 and below 100, it is called as horizontal. Why minus 10 and negative 8, uh, 79 is a distal angular, and if it's four below, it's invert. Okay. That is one of the classical classification. And modifying this, Pell and Gregory made another classification. He what he added to this was two other factors to the Windows classification. That is the depth of the impaction and the Ramos relationship of the impaction. The depth of relation, the depth relationship is if the tooth, highest point of the impacted tooth is at a level with the erupted second molar, it is at a position A or level A. If the highest point is below the occlusal level of the uh, second molar and above the CEJ of the second molar, it is position B. If the tooth is completely embedded and below the CEJ of the adjacent tooth, it is position C. While the uh, Ramos relationship is, if there is adequate space from the distal end of the second molar and the anterior border of Ramos, for this tooth to erupt, it is a class one. While if it's halfway through, it is a class two. And if the tooth is completely embedded within the ramus of mandible, it is a class three. And likewise, windows. So this was present degree classification. These are the two classification that we would regularly check to assess the impacted tooth. So how do you diagnose this? We know there is impacted tooth, but we don't know how the tooth is inside. That is by imaging. We usually, we can advise there are so many options for imaging. The conventional radiographs like in the oral periapical, IOPAS, 
radiograph, OPG, radiograph, etc. And the newer techniques like CEC. So whenever you take a OPG only, you can actually see the actual picture, right? This is an impacted tool. When you take the OPG, we saw that there is a pathology associated, especially in case of OKC kind of lesion where the growth is in an anthroposterior uh, direction rather than a buccolingual direction. So, uh, radiography is always important before the uh, procedure. Okay. So, how do you interpret the radiography? Most of the dentists will be knowing these basic things that you have to check. That is the type of impaction, that is the classification of impaction, position and depth of the impacted group, the ones that I told in the uh, palindrome degree classification, the root pattern of the impacted group, shape of crown, and the relationship of the nerve, the inferior alveolar canal to the root. These all things everybody said. So how does this root pattern influence the difficulty of third molar removal? So, so I'll show you one example. When the, we may think that in a tooth where the root is not formed, we may think that that tooth is going to be very easy, right? But it's, all, it's always the opposite of the case because what happens is when you try to put a uh, elevator here, that tooth will keep on rolling inside the socket and even forceps won't. That is called as a rolling tooth. When the root is not at all developed, that root is going to be difficult. When there is hypersomatosis, a bulbous root, it's going to be difficult. A thin, a narrow root, it's going to be difficult because the tooth can, root can break. If the mesiodistal width of the root is more than that of the crown, we'll have to section the tooth longitudinally. And the easiest tooth that are, the easiest tooth to remove are the ones with one by third to two by third of the root formation. And sometimes in X-ray, what happens is we'll see a 2D image and we may miss out some of the uh, multi multiple rooted tooth, like so because of superposition. In this case, you can see that this is a dilacerated, there is a dilacerated tooth. And when you attempt after extracting, you can see that, that it was actually a four rooted third model. So these are things that is associated with the root pattern. And how does the crown affect? Uh, the procedure. Last, large square crown with prominent crown. Large crowns are very difficult to remove. And also, if the crown is obstructed by the second molar, there is locking of the crown and it's difficult to uh, surgically re uh, remove the tooth. We need sectioning of the tooth. And then there is the relationship of the mandibular canal with the root apex. To, there are, like, to assess this, Hohen Poitone in 1960 put forward seven criteria to check the proximity of the uh, root apex to the canal. Four were associated with uh, the root and four were associated with the inferior root canal. Those associated with the root are darkening of the root, dilaceration or deflection of the root, narrowing of the root, and bifurcate root. While those associated with the canal are, we can see visit, uh, interruption of the canal, deflection of the canal, and sometimes narrowing of the canal. So whenever you see something like this, you'll have to uh, advise some more CBCT or something, uh, some other imaging technique to analyze and predict the difficulty. So these things are everybody knows, but there are other things, other radiographic features that one, one should check before doing the procedure. One is the texture of the investing mode. The more the trapeculation, the younger the patient will be and the more the elasticity will be and the procedure may get very easy. And in compact bone, procedure is going to be very difficult. Position and root pattern of the second molar. Sometimes the shape and position of the second molar itself will obstruct the tooth and cause a locking tooth. And one of the important thing is the uh, external oblique ridge. If the external oblique ridge is very vertical, what happens is we won't have enough accessibility and we'll have to remove a considerable amount of bone to even see the tooth, right? And if the external oblique ridge is uh, like oblique, the accessibility is good and the procedure gets easy. And we have to check the position and depth of the uh, impacted tooth. We can use uh, wall lines for assessing that. And we have to also rule out any existing pathology associated with the third molar. And we have to also check the buccal and lingual orientation of the impacted tooth. The buccally tilted tooth are more easier to remove than the lingually tilted tooth. Okay. And then we have to check the arc of rotation, which guide us if we need a sectioning of tooth or not. And how do you do a, uh, check the buccal and lingual orientation of the 
uh, tooth with a conventional radiograph. For that, we had to take two radiographs. I think everybody was be well versed with Clark's rule, slope technique, and all. Exactly, that's what we use here. If you do a horizontal uh, tooth shock technique, we can actually uh, localize the orientation of the tooth in a buccolingual uh, direction. And with using a vertical uh, tooth shock technique, we can actually assess the position of inferior alveolar canal to the root of it. Okay. So we can localize the tooth with two x-rays. And the arc of rotation, I guess I told, this is a criteria, this is a procedure that we can do to assess if we need sectioning of tooth or not. It's a simple procedure. What we do is we mark the uh, tip of a distal root and another marking will be on the tip of the mesiolingual cusp. And we take this distance as the radius and draw an arc. And if this arc is touching the anterior tooth, not the second molar, that means the tooth is locked and the tooth will require section. Okay. So now you know what is the, how do you interpret the uh, radiograph and all, and how do you know, assess if you need a sectioning and all. How do you actually interpret this? How do you actually assess this? How do you put this into practice? For that, we have to trace this radiograph or do something and do actual drawing to analyze the difficulty. For that, we need some materials. The materials we need is IOP and OPG, obviously, radiographic view box, tracing paper, paper clips, pencil, calibrated scale, protector, compass, and marker. After having all this, we'll start the tracing. In case of IOP, what we have to draw, we have to trace the all the tooth, first molar, second molar, third molar, and we have to trace the inferior alveolar canal, the alveolar crust, the external and internal oblique grids. If the follicle is present, we have to trace that follicle. Also. Same way in OPG, we have to add the mandibular outline also, apart from the uh, landmarks already described in IOP. So this is give us an idea about the tool over which we can do the assessment using War lines. War lines was put forward by the same George Winder who made the classification. War line is nothing but it's an abbreviation for white line, amber line, and red line. White line is nothing but a line drawn from, from anterior to posterior, touching the occlusal level of all the erupted tooth. And this gives us an idea about the depth and inclination of the impacted tooth. Gives us if it's a mesoangular, distangular, or vertical, and position at which the tooth is lying below the bone level. And then there is the amber line. It is drawn from posterior to uh, anterior, with touching the external oblique grids. It gives us the idea about the alveolar bone covering the tooth. All right. And then there is the red line. Red line is a line, imaginary line drawn perpendicular from the amber line to a point where we intend to use our elevator. It's the point where the uh, elevator will be applied. So according to all authors, if the red line, the longer the red line, the more difficult the case will be. After five millimeter, for every millimeter of uh, length increased, the difficulty increases three points. So for every one millimeter, there is a threefold increase of difficulty. And after eight to nine millimeter, that case will be very difficult. We may have to take up this case under GH general anesthesia. Otherwise, we'll have to remove the third mo uh, second molar and first molar to even see the tooth. Okay. So it's about assessment. But what are the limitations of conventional radiograph? Conventional radiograph meaning OPGs and IUP. Obviously, it is a 2D image. Because of that, there will be superimposition. And we will lose the uh, details of all the structures in, involved. We may not be able to assess the proximity of inferior alveolar nerve to the root apex with a single radiograph. And there will be less uh, details. And in case some patients have too much of gag reflex, we may not be able to put the IOP inside the patient mouth. And we may end up with a incomplete radiograph and we'll miss out the major uh, root apex and the inferior alveolar canal. So in these cases, the uh, OPG or the IOP is showing some pro close proximity of inferior alveolar nerve to the apex. We should suggest the patient or advise the patient with the CBCT. It's a 3D book. 
uh, it is a good uh, uh, imaging technique where we can easily identify the relationship, the proximity of the relationship. We can even predict the uh, risk of damage to the inferior alveolar nerve, and it can be used as a good uh, educational uh, media to teach the patient about the possibility of the difficulty or the complications that you may ex expect during the procedure, after the procedure. And it also gives us the idea about the density of the bone where we are going to do the procedure. And apart from that, with conventional CT, it is less expensive and have less radiation exposure. So now the CBCT is becoming a norm. Most of the surgeons are preferring to give CBCT prior to a case where uh, the inferior alveolar nerve is very proximal to the uh, root apex. So these are some cases that were the dentist while doing the procedure encountered too much massive bleeding and had to abandon the procedure and do the hemostasis. And after the procedure, like after abandoning the procedure, when uh, the CBCT was taken, they found out that there was an apparent accessory artery of the inferior alveolar artery and it was going through the impacted tube and because of uh, injury to this artery there was massive bleeding. In this case you can even see that this uh, inf inferior alveolar nerve is actually closing that tube, it's going around the tube and here also the two inferior alveolar nerve is actually going between the between the roots. So in these cases, we have to expect too much of bleeding. We can expect nerve frustration. These all things we can tell the patient prior to surgery and we can be prepared. Okay. So we will go back to our first case. I'm sure that when I told it was a distal angular impaction, some, must, some, of the uh, some of the audience must have thought, why did he tell distal angular impaction? Why can't this be a vertical impaction, right? This looks like very vertical because the occlusal level is at the same, same line with the erupted tooth. It is totally erupted, it's fully erupted. And when did this speaker told that this is a distangular impacted tooth, not a vertical impact? That's because it's, uh, it's all about perception. The reason that we found that it was like some people had this doubt that this was vertical was because of perception. The point of you from where you assess the radiograph. So whenever you take a radiograph, you usually don't apply the second model. But there is a simple technique to correct that. What you have to do is you have to just rotate the radiograph so that the second molar is upright. Okay. And we draw a line with the long axis of the second molar and a draw, we'll uh, draw a line touching the occlusal surface of the third molar. And if the line is actually diverging away from the second molar, that means the tooth is distally tilted and it is a distal angular impaction, right? And alternatively, there is a simple technique. We just have to check the interdental space between the tooth. Like you can see between the first and second molar, there is a constant space. Likewise, between the second premolar and the second, first premolar, there is a constant premolar space. While the space between the second molar and third molar is closed. That means it is closely touching the tooth and it is a distangular impaction going backward. Okay. This is how you uh, diagnose or assess a distangular impaction. Okay. So we, now we know that the, this is how you uh, assess the radiograph, but how do you assess the difficulty? Right? We know how to see if it's a mesoangular impaction, how to classify the depth. And so how do you assess the difficulty? By war lines, obviously we can find out this is going to be difficult at all, but there are some indices that have aids in deciding the difficulty. The symbol of, simplest one is parent scale. He just uh, scored the impacted tooth in the EC moderate and difficult, EC being the cases requiring only forceps, moderate being the cases requiring osteotomy, and difficult being the cases requiring both, both osteotomy and odontotomy. And it was later modified with severe, where we need root sectioning also, osteotomy, odontotomy, and tooth root sectioning. Okay. And then there is the Pedersen scale. Pedersen scale is nothing but a scale made from the Pellin degree classification. So, what Pedersen found out was mesoangular impaction are the most easiest to, to remove, while distoangular are the most dif difficult to remove, and horizontal and vertical being in between. And according to depth, 
the more the depth the more difficulty so obviously class c will be position c will be most difficult and relationship with the ra available ramus space if the tooth is embedded within the ramus it is going to be difficult and the cumulative score was taken the least that is ecb 3 to 4 and the difficult case is having a score between 7 to 10 that is pedersen scale so you will get a better idea of the like degree classification this is the windows classification and this is the relationship of the depth right that is position a position b and position c and this is relationship with the ramus this is a class 1 class 2 and class 3 okay then there is one elaborate uh, uh, index put forward by metrigar in 1985 it's called as bark assessment it's nothing but the deprivation of index classification height of mandible angle of second molar root shape follicle size and etc so it is classification everybody knows it's an angular distance vertical and horizontal impaction then there is the height of mandible it is this line drawn from the cj of the second molar to the nearest point touching the lower border of the mandible so the longer this length the more difficult it will be because the bone will be more compact and obviously that will be also better. and there is then there is the angle of second molar and uh, here what we do is we draw a long axis uh, uh, line corresponding to the long axis of the second molar and compare it with a fiducial line and take the angle okay fiducial horizontal line and take the angle the more the angle more difficulty the case will be the lesser the angle the easier the case will be and likewise follicle size in most of the many of the cases when you take an iup we can see a, see a small radio loosened area. that is because of the presence of a soft tissue that is our follicle the larger this follicle the easier the case will be okay then there is exit path. so when you are a student this exit path is one of the major thing that confuses us because in that we have uh, written uh, if the mesial cusp is uh, covered it will be difficult distal cusp is covered it will be uh, easy but how do you assess this for that what you have to do is we have to take the center point of the CEJ and rotate this tooth okay we will rotate this tooth and make it upright and if the anterior border of ramus is covering only the distal cusp that means the case is going to be easy and if it's covering also the mesial cups, it's going to be difficult. Like this, we'll put the score, and in this follicle size, as it increases, uh, the case gets uh, easier. So, so this is the only thing having a negative score. Everything else, as the score goes up, as the uh, angle goes up, the case does get difficult, and the cumulative score is taken to find out the difficulty. So this is the bar index. All right, so. We will start. We I will try to demonstrate all this interpretation into one of a case. So we began with a case that looked very easy and ended up being very difficult. So now I am going to show you one case that looks very difficult, apparently difficult to most of the people, and ended up being easy because we know how to interpret the tooth and we did the procedure correct. So this was a young adult female who came with uh, pericornitis, having a uh, pain on the lower right smaller region, uh, last smaller region so on clinical examination we can appreciate that there is and the second molar is missing so is third molar only the first molar is present right and it's actually not at all erupted so i advised the patient for an uh, opg and found that it's actually a case of double impact right you can see the second molar, that is the lower right second molar, and the lower right third molar is actually impacted, uh, and the second molar being very close and locked to the first molar. And we can see there is some anomaly in the inferior alveolar dental uh, nerve canal. So it's kind of close to the root of this. So as I told, we'll start the assessment. We'll start with bar lines, OK? So as you do the war lines, you draw the uh, white line through the opposite level of the erupted tooth, we can find that this third molar is actually above the uh, white line. And second molar is below the white line. This third molar being above the white line itself made the procedure easy. And when we do the amber line, we can see that there is not much bone covering the uh, impacted third molar, but there is some depth when you look at the second molar and also the red line proved the same you can see the red line is kind of very big 
for the second molar and it's small for the uh, third molar and it denotes that there is not much bone cutting or anything bone cutting to be done for the third molar but there should we have to expect some sort of difficulty for the second molar and the inferior alveolar canal is also kind of very close so then i did the arc of rotation analysis so when i did the arc of rotation like taking the tip of the distal uh, root and the tip of the mesolingual cusp taking this as a radius i did an arc of rotation I found that in third model it was free of interference, while in second model it was touching the first one. So I need to split the two or section the two to take out the second model, while I don't need any tooth cutting to take out the third model, right? So that is what exactly I did. All right, we did the uh, uh, Watts incision, modified Watts, Watts incision then did a minimal bone cutting so that there was some amount of bone covering on the buccal aspect so i had to do a, some bone cutting to see the tooth and we could appreciate the second model here that is the four or seven and there is the four eight okay so then what i did i just elevated the eight out and sectioned the four seven at c and took the tooth out by dividing the second model Right. So this was a divide and rule piecemeal approach. Well, this four eight was taken as in total as a single piece. But only thing I did here was uh, I put as I put a small purchase point here with the bar so that I can engage the elevator here because there was not much space for the elevator to engage. So there was a, I put a small uh, purchase point here for ease of removal. And after removing, there was minimal bone guttering and even the bone. Interradicular and the interceptal bone was actually preserved with minimal trauma to the bone because the bone belongs to the patient and tooth belongs to the surgeon. And always remember divide and rule. If you cannot take the tooth out as a single piece, divide it, split it as much as possible to take the tooth out. Okay, but don't test the bone. So, likewise, I am showing one more case here. So, this is a case of Mesia angular 4 8. When we took the OPG, we saw that after tracing, we saw that there is carious 27 because of the impacted tooth and subsequent foot impaction. The second molar got carious, and analyzing the uh, root form root, we can see that it's actually dilacerated root with locking of the distal root into the mesial root, right? And the nerve is very close by. Yeah? So we did the bar lines. We see that the red line is kind of long, and we have to express some difficulty. And the white line also was in a class. Uh, it was a class uh, one position A impaction. And we did the arc of rotation and we saw that this tooth is actually touching the second model. And because of this arc of rotation, we decided to section the tooth at the CEHA. And because this root is having an anomaly, because of the abnormal root shape and dilaceration and very closeness of this nerve proximity, we decided to split the root. So exactly that is what we did. Elevated with the, uh, we reflect the flap with a ward incision, section the tooth, we saw the uh, root, section the root longitudinally, all right. Then we took the tooth out as a piecemeal divide and root policy and we can appreciate that even the radical interceptum is preserved here all right so that's how you manage the case always remember this thing it's my mantra actually everybody every such is one bone belongs to the patient tooth belongs to the surgeon respect the soft tissue that soft tissue will respect you back so summarizing what are the factors that make uh, impacted third molar uh, removal easier that is mesial angular impaction, class one impaction, position A, that is the foot tooth is fully erupted and root formation is up to one by third to two by third, fused conical roots, wide periodontal space, large follicle size, large, less dense bone, that is elastic bone, separated from the second molar, if the tooth is separated from the second molar, soft tissue impaction and young age. Okay. So what are the factors that makes the tooth removal difficult? Distal angular impaction, class three, position C, long thin roots that are prone to uh, fracture, and divergent curved roots, narrow periodontal space, thin follicle, dense inelastic bone that is compact bone, you'll have to cut a lot and it will be difficult to take the tooth out. 
contact with the second molar, like the arc of rotation of the tooth is locked, complete bony impaction and old age. In old age, what happens? The, the, the healing period will be more, and patient will have some comorbidities, diabetes, all these things, and the bone will be dense, and it will be a compact bone, and the case will be difficult. Okay, so I'm also showing one maxillary impacted third molar for description. So here, what we have to remember is, in the case of mandibular impacted third molar, mesioangular impaction is more easier than distoangular impaction. But in case of uh, maxillary, mesioangular is more difficult. This is a mesioangular case, and distoangular is easier in maxillary impact impaction cases. And we have to see about the maxillary sinus also, the proximity of the maxillary sinus. Also. This case, you can see that there is only a thin bone between the tooth and the maxillary sinus. And in this case, we had to expect oriental fistula and if the day is bad, displacement of tooth into the maxillary sinus. In this case, when we did the case, actually there was an oriental fistula and we had to close the oriental fistula with a buccal pad of fat. So when you are attending these kind of cases, make sure that you are well versed with the kind of taking the flap and closing the oriental fistula because more than 50% of the cases, there will be oriental fistula that run the displacement of the maxillary back to tooth into the maxillary sinus. Okay. So, what are the complications to expect? Interoperatively, we have to expect hemorrhage, trauma. Like most of the surgeons must have gone through a case where there is too much of hemorrhage during this impaction. Trauma to adjacent tooth, instrument fracture. If you use a 701 bar, after two days of use, it's going to fracture. Right? And displacement of the tooth root into the facial spaces, iatrogenic mandibular uh, fracture, maxillary tuberosity, uh, tuberosity fracture, displacement of tooth root into the maxillary sinus, postoperative infection, dry socket, and nerve paresthesia. And nerve paresthesia, in my experience, I have found that inferior nerve, inferior alveolar nerve paresthesia is not that troublesome. Patient will uh, come and tell you, but uh, mostly gets corrected or cured by six months. But if it's a lingual nerve paresthesia, that patient is going to bucker you for a long because it's very difficult for the patient with the lingual paresthesia, right? Like tongue paresthesia. So most of the authors agree that the lingual nerve lies between two and a half millimeter from the uh, alveolar crest inferiorly and about 0.5 millimeter medially. So we have to be careful that you don't touch the lingual plate or the lingual soft tissue. And in case of this displacement of tooth or root into the facial spaces, like some mandibular space or all, we'll have to open up externally and remove the tooth. This the displacement into the lingual pores. And then there is the displacement of into maxillary sinus. This is case one case that came to the department with where uh, then is tried to ex extract the impacted third molar, uh, the maxillary third molar, and it went to the uh, maxillary sinus. And it was taken out by a Cadwell loop procedure. And this is a description of a tooth that went into the infraorbital, infratemporal space. Right? So don't worry when complication occurs because a surgeon without complication have never done a surgery. There is a learn, learning curve for all surgeries. I have seen even my HODs, even the seniors getting stuck. It's not like that the juniors will get stuck less, but seniors will get stuck. Uh, uh, juniors will stuck more, get stuck or have complications more, while seniors will have less number of complications. But everybody will have complications. So if you are doing surgery, you will get complications, right? So never be worried about the complications. So I like to end this session with a profound experience from my PG time. This is one thing that I don't want to see again in my life, actually. This is a one in a million case. Well, what happened was, this was a 23-year-old male patient who went to a dentist, all right, and show, told that there is a black spot between the 4-7 and 4 eight, and that dentist just probed this area, and there was massive bleeding. Uh, the patient was brought to the emergency room of Calicut Dental College while I was doing my pioneer PG. And uh, the patient was having, when, the, when I saw the case, the patient was having a big chunk of cotton inside the mouth, and that he was totally bloody because of shirt and everything was totally bloody. The moment I removed the cotton, the blood just splattered to my uh, face. And it was identified as a vascular valve formation. That's a high flow vascular valve formation immediately. And the patient was uh, given taxi pack and everything. And all the blood profile was done. 
And unfortunately, this patient had B negative blood group, and it was a very big difficulty. The patient came by 6 p.m., and by the time we intubated uh, the anesthetist, intubated and we cauterized the case, it was almost 12. And luckily, the patient is still alive and walking. And next day, we, after uh, doing the hemostasis, we actually sent the patient to Sijitra for further treatment, where he was embolized, and further treatment was done. So this is the case. You can actually see this impacted tooth jumping. Up. You can see a visible bruit. Same with the uh, extraorals. Extraorally, we can see the ear also have a bruit. Okay, whenever you see a bruit on a tooth and the tooth is literally jumping, don't put any surgical instrument there. It's going to be trouble and that bleeding, especially in this case, it was a uh, arterial with a small formation with the external carotid artery as the feeder. It's a very difficult, it was a very troublesome case. It was a good experience because next day the patient was alive and fine. Anyway, I'd like to stop this session uh, by thanking Triple A for inviting me to the session and also my colleagues, Dr. Anjali Verma, Dr. Paminder Singh, for giving me some good positive inputs and also Dr. Arpit and other PGs, chairs and intern, who helped me find all the cases and assisted me in those procedures that I demonstrated. I think if you have any doubts, you can ask now. And uh, I like to invite Dr. Eldosa to add something to the point that I have told about. I hope some you guys have understood something and like, something nice to take home. Thank you, sir. Thank you for rendering such a wonderful talk. It was actually not above our heads. It was in a very simplified form. Thank you so much for simplifying the topic as well. And uh, moving on to the queries, we have some queries which have popped up. Uh, could you please attend them? Shall I just read it out? So uh, the first question is that, uh, how to differentiate between the external oblique ridge and internal oblique ridge uh, in a radiograph? That's actually a nice question because everybody has this doubt, right? Uh, actually what happens is in radiograph, we can actually see two lines. We can usually see two lines. But what most of the surgeons prefer is we will choose the upper line as the external oblique. That's what you, we usually do. Actually, there is no clear cut way to differentiate between the external oblique and internal oblique. It will be usually the superior line, upper line, right? Any other questions? Okay, sir. So another question is that when to decide between LA and GA? LNG, I to already told right uh, about that uh, red line. If the red line is uh, more than nine millimeter, we'll have to take up the case for GA. And also, if you are planning for a multiple impact, like you are planning in the case where or, uh, that case I showed before, this case is one perfect example for a case to be taken up for GA because there is multiple impact. All four, all eights are impacted. This is a very difficult case with a deep uh, red line. And we have cases where the maxillary, uh, there is a chance of maxillary tuberosity fracture and oral fistula formation and displacement of tooth into the tissue spaces. Especially here also, the tooth can go into the submandibular space. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, we have explained about the different parameters, but uh, still there is another question. Can you please repeat? I cannot hear. Sir, uh, sir, what if the nerve is very close to the mandibular canal? You have explained the parameters. Still, there's a question regarding that. Actually, we can do something like we can actually, if the case is asymptomatic, better not to touch because there is going to be paresthesia. One thing we can do is actually, uh, there's something called as uh, corona odontotomy. We just cut the tooth, crown out. It's nothing but the uh, sectioning of the tooth crown and taking out the crew. That is now called as corona odontotomy. That we can do and wait for this tooth to rot. That is one procedure that is like, I haven't done yet, but I, I've seen this in lots of uh, literature. Like that procedure can be done and wait for the tooth to rot and take the tooth out. This one procedure we can do here. 
And otherwise, we'll have to split the tooth into multiple plane and take the tooth as simple as possible, like a piecemeal. That can also be done. I think this clarifies another question also. So what to do if the nerve canal is interfering with the root apex? Same thing. We we'll have to, like always, I always tell divide and two. Split. Most of the, my JS or Indians are attending here. They'll be doing that. I always tell divide and two. Good, good grip. These are the two, two things I always tell. So divide and two. Take the tooth as piece, piece small pieces. This is what elders are also taught me. One more question. What are the considerations to be taken if there happens to be a nerve damage uh, based on the severity? Nerve uh, damage concentration taken is first thing is that when you see a uh, close proximal uh, proximity of the nerve, you inform the patient. Tell him or yeah, tell her that you have to expect. There is in textbook case, there is about uh, if I am correct, it's about 0.3 percentage to 1 percentage of nerve damage is there and 0.01 percentage of lingual nerve damage is there according to my doctor. So you'll have to tell the patient that's going to happen. And if the patient comes back with the nerve damage, you can always start with the uh, neurobiome, that's vitamin B12, that's good for nerve regeneration. And maybe you can also start with steroids. But inferior alveolar nerve damage, it's usually cured in like six months or so. It's a lingual nerve damage that is more troublesome. But always medical options. If the damage is done, then we'll have to wait. That there is a neuropraxia and we'll have to wait for that neuropraxia to heal. It's before what you do before that comes. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So we have come to the end of the question and answer session. Uh, Elder sir, kindly speak for me. Thank you, Dr. Mithilesh, for entering such a wonderful talk on different aspects of impaction. So, and uh, thanks to Elder Sir for moderating the session as well. And uh, now we are moving on to the felicitation. May I now invite Advocate T.S. Rashid Sir, Administrative Chairman, Anurindu College and Hospital, to felicitate the gathering. Sir, please. Okay, sorry. Good evening, all. Very good evening, all. Uh, dear brother Binyamin, uh, Dr. Jijo, Dr. Liza, Dr. Jospol, uh, moderator Sri Eldos, Doctor, and uh, uh, members, President of the Alumni Association, Deepak Thomas, Secretary Ronin. Uh, uh, then again, organization, organizers like uh, Sneha. Then again, I'm very happy to see that uh, Mithilesh, Mithilesh is uh, giving the, given the lecture on this uh, platform, which is uh, really, you know, um, it is uh, like, you know, uh, he, was, he was a student. I'm very happy to see that Mithilesh uh, uh, he was a student of uh, the college, and and now he has uh, he has become so uh, so so eminent doctor uh, dentist in this field. Very happy to see you, and I am very happy to know that you are a, a rank holder in MBS Middlesh. Very 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 happy to hear that. Thank you, sir. Yeah, very happy to hear that. And uh, and again, you know, uh, since you are in Maulana Azad Medical College, it is going to be very renowned college uh, in uh, India, very famous college. That is also a very good, uh, uh, very good thing. Which your future will uh, will be very bright since you you work for that college. 
and main thing is i i don't i am not going to take further class because already mithilesh has taken very good class so yes especially in dentistry if i going to take a class in dentistry to to look i know that it will be very very ox situation so i got to say something inspiring you people or something if you can if i can motivate you some way like you know saying something uh, something something to you to inspire then oru oru idile i think there is uh, I, all our malayalis have, and everybody can understand my uh, my speech uh, if i speak in malayalam i hope i think there is only one or two non malayalis in this group so let me uh, uh, speak in malayalam njan nerthe sujipichathu pole thanne main aayittu ഈ ഡോക്ടേഴ്സിനെ അതുപോലെ ചെറുപ്പക്കാരെ ഇൻസ്പയർ ചെയ്യാൻ എന്തെങ്കിലും ഒരു സാധ്യത ഉണ്ടോ എന്നാണ് ഞാൻ നോക്കുന്നത് അപ്പൊ അതിൻ്റെ ഒരു ഒരു കാരണ ഒരു ഒരു രീതിയിൽ എനിക്കിന്ന് നിങ്ങളോട് പറയാൻ പറ്റിയ ഒരു സബ്ജക്ട് കിട്ടിയത് വളരെ ചെറുപ്പത്തിൽ തന്നെ എം സി സി മദ്രാസിൽ നിന്ന് ഡിഗ്രി എടുത്ത് അത് കഴിഞ്ഞിട്ട് ഐ എം ഇ എന്ന എം ബി എ എടുത്ത ഒരാളെ പറ്റിയാണ് എനിക്ക് പറയാനുള്ളത് അത് മയാട്ടൂർ ടെക്സ്റ്റൈൽ ടെക്സ്റ്റൈൽ മില്ലിൽ ഒരു സാധാരണ ഒരു ജോലിക്കാരിയായി വന്ന് അതിനുശേഷം അവിടെ അവിടെ ഈ ടെക്സ്റ്റൈൽ ഇൻഡസ്ട്രിയിൽ അവിടെ വലിയ സ്ട്രൈക്ക് ഒക്കെ വന്നപ്പോൾ ജോലി നഷ്ടപ്പെട്ടിട്ട് ജോൺസൺ ആൻഡ് ജോൺസണിൽ ജോലി കിട്ടുകയും അവിടെ നിന്നും അതിൻ്റെ പ്രൊഡക്റ്റ് ജോൺസൺ ആൻഡ് ജോൺസൺ്റെ പ്രൊഡക്റ്റ് ലോകമെമ്പാടും കൊണ്ടുപോകാൻ വേണ്ടി ശ്രമിക്കുന്നതിനിടയിലാണ് ഡിസംബർ ആയിരത്തി തൊള്ളായിരത്തി എഴുപത്തി ഏഴില് ഒരു വെക്കേഷൻ ദിവസം മദ്രാസിൽ അമേരിക്കൻ ലൈബ്രറി പോകാൻ ഒരു ഇട വരികയും അമേരിക്കൻ ലൈബ്രറിയിൽ ഇരിക്കുമ്പോൾ ന്യൂസ് വീക്ക് എന്ന് പറയുന്ന ഒരു മാഗസിൻ കാണുകയും ആ മാഗസിനിൽ ജിമ്മി കാർട്ടറും ജെറാൾഡ് ഫോർഡും ഉള്ള ഒരു മുഖചിത്രം അത് കണ്ട് അതെന്താണെന്ന് നോക്കുമ്പോൾ അതിനകത്ത് ഏ അതിനകത്ത് മുഖചിത്രമായിട്ട് അവരുടെ ആ രണ്ടുപേരുടെ പടം കണ്ടപ്പോൾ എന്താണെന്ന് അറിയാൻ വേണ്ടി അത് നോക്കുമ്പോൾ എ ഷെയ്ഡ് ഓഫ് ഡിഫറൻസ് എന്ന ഒരു ലേഖനമാണ് അതിൻ്റെ അകത്ത് ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നത് എ ഷെയ്ഡ് ഓഫ് ഡിഫറൻസ് വ്യത്യസ്തമായിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു സംഭവം അതെന്താണെന്ന് വായിക്കുമ്പോൾ യേൽ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റി യു എസ് എയിലുള്ള യേൽ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയിലെ ഒരു പുതിയ ബിസിനസ് സ്കൂൾ തുടങ്ങുകയാണെന്നും ഒരു പുതിയ പ്രോഗ്രാം തുടങ്ങുകയാണെന്ന് മനസ്സിലായി അങ്ങനെ അതിൽ ആപ്ലിക്കേഷൻ കൊടുത്ത് അതിന് ജോയിൻ ചെയ്യാൻ ആഗ്രഹം കാണിച്ച് അപേക്ഷ കൊടുത്തു കൊടുത്തപ്പോൾ ആ അപേക്ഷയ്ക്ക് ഒരു മറുപടിയായിട്ട് കിട്ടിയത് അതിൽ പഠിക്കാനായിട്ട് കണ്ടമാനം പൈസയും അതിൻ്റെ ആ പൈസയുടെ അമ്പത് ശതമാനം ലോണായിട്ട് കിട്ടുമെന്നും ഇരുപത് ശതമാനം പണിയെടുത്ത് വർക്ക് ചെയ്തിട്ട് തിരിച്ച് പേ ചെയ്യാനും ബാക്കിയുള്ള മുപ്പത് ശതമാനം സ്കോളർഷിപ്പുമായിട്ട് കിട്ടുമെന്നും മനസ്സിലായി അങ്ങനെ അതിൽ ചേരണമെന്ന് ആഗ്രഹിക്കുമ്പോൾ അത് അത്രയും പോലും പൈസ ഇല്ലാതെ ചേരാൻ പറ്റാത്ത ഒരു സാഹചര്യം ഉണ്ടായി അത് എങ്ങനെയാണ് അതിനെ തരണം ചെയ്യുക എന്ന് അന്വേഷിക്കുമ്പോൾ അതിനെ അത് അന്വേഷിച്ച് നടക്കുമ്പോൾ ഇവരുടെ ഇതിന് മുൻപ് വർക്ക് ചെയ്തിരുന്ന സ്ഥാപനത്തിലെ ആളുകൾ സഹായിക്കാൻ മുതിരുകയും അവരങ്ങനെ യു എസിൽ പോയി ഏൽ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയിൽ പോയി ഇതിൻ്റെ എം ബി എ മാസ്റ്റേഴ്സ് ചെയ്യുകയും ബി സി ജി എന്ന് പറയുന്ന കോഴ്സ് ചെയ്യുകയും അവിടെ നിന്ന് അവർക്ക് ഒരു വല്ലാത്ത ഒരു ടേണിംഗ് പോയിന്റ് ജീവിതത്തിൽ വരികയും അവർ ഏറ്റവും കൂടുതലായിട്ട് എനിക്ക് നിങ്ങളുടെ അടുത്ത് പറയാനുള്ള യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയെ പറ്റി പറയുന്ന ഒരു സാഹചര്യം ഉണ്ടായി അവിടെ അമേരിക്കൻ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയിൽ പഠിക്കുമ്പോൾ അവിടെ ഉണ്ടായിരുന്ന ഒരു അനുഭവമാണ് എനിക്ക് നിങ്ങളോട് പറയാൻ ഈ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയിലുള്ള ഏറ്റവും വലിയ പ്രത്യേകത എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞാൽ അധ്യാപകരും വിദ്യാർത്ഥികളും തമ്മിലുള്ള ആ ഒരു ബന്ധം അത് അതിനെ പറ്റിയാണ് കൂടുതലായിട്ട് പറഞ്ഞിരിക്കുന്നത് അതായത് യാതൊരു രീതിയിലുമുള്ള ഒരു ഡിഫറൻസിയേഷൻ ബിറ്റ്വീൻ ദ സ്റ്റാഫ് ആൻഡ് സ്റ്റുഡൻസ് അവരുമായിട്ട് വളരെ ഫ്രണ്ട്ലി വളരെ ബോണ്ടിങ് റിലേഷൻഷിപ്പ് ആയിരുന്നു അതാണ് അവർക്ക് ഏറ്റവും കൂടുതൽ അവരുടെ ജീവിതത്തിലെ പ്രചോദനമായി എന്നുള്ളതാണ് അവർ പറയുന്നത് അധ്യാപകർ അധ്യാപകർ വരുമ്പോൾ ഇവിടുത്തെ പോലെ എണീറ്റ് നിന്ന് തൊഴുകയോ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ അധ്യാപകരെ പേടിച്ച് മാറി നിൽക്കുന്ന സാഹചര്യം അധ്യാപകർ കുട്ടികളെ ഭയപ്പെടുന്നു തിരിച്ചും അധ്യാപകരോടുള്ള ബഹുമാനവും ഇതെല്ലാം കുട്ടികൾ കാണിക്കുകയും എന്നാൽ അവർക്ക് 
നൂറ് ശതമാനവും സ്വാതന്ത്ര്യമുള്ള എപ്പോ വേണമെങ്കിലും ക്ലാസ്സിൽ നിന്ന് പോവാം എപ്പോ വേണമെങ്കിലും ക്ലാസ്സിൽ കയറി വരാം ഇതെല്ലാം പ്രത്യേകം എടുത്തു പറയുന്ന സാഹചര്യം അപ്പൊ അങ്ങനെയുള്ള ഒരു ഒരു സാഹചര്യമാണ് അവർക്ക് ഈ അമേരിക്കൻ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയിൽ നിന്ന് കിട്ടിയതെന്നാണ് അതിനകത്ത് ഏറ്റവും കൂടുതൽ പറഞ്ഞത് അപ്പൊ അങ്ങനെയുള്ള ഒരു ഒരു പശ്ചാത്തലത്തിൽ നിന്നും അവർക്ക് അവര് വളർന്ന് ആ ഒരു അനുഭവത്തിലൂടെ വളർന്ന് അവർക്ക് അമേരിക്കയിൽ ജോലി അന്വേഷിക്കുമ്പോൾ ഈ പെപ്സിയുടെ പർച്ചേസിംഗ് ഓഫീസിലാണ് ജോലി കിട്ടുന്നത് ആ പർച്ചേസിംഗ് ഓഫീസിൽ നിന്ന് ജോലി കിട്ടി അതിനകത്ത് നിന്ന് ഒരു പത്ത് ആറ് കൊല്ലം വരെ വർക്ക് ചെയ്യുമ്പോഴാണ് പെപ്സിയുടെ സി ഇ ഒ ആയി മാറുന്നത് ആ സി ഇ ഒ ആയ ആയി ഏതാണ്ട് പന്ത്രണ്ട് വർഷത്തോളം വർക്ക് ചെയ്തിട്ട് ഏതാണ്ട് പന്ത്രണ്ട് വർഷക്കാലം വർക്ക് ചെയ്ത ആള് ഇപ്പോൾ ഈ അടുത്ത കാലത്താണ് അതിൻ്റെ ഇതിനകത്ത് നിന്നും റിസൈൻ റിട്ടയർ ചെയ്ത് വരുന്ന ഒരു സാഹചര്യം ഉണ്ടായി അപ്പൊ അവരുടെ അതാണ് ഇന്ദിരാ നൂറി എന്ന് പറയുന്ന ഇന്ദിരാ നൂ നൂയി എന്ന് പറയുന്ന ആ ഒരു ഇന്ത്യക്കാരിയെ പറ്റിയാണ് ഞാൻ നിങ്ങളോട് പറഞ്ഞത് അപ്പൊ അതിനകത്ത് ഏറ്റവും കൂടുതൽ പറയാനുള്ള ഒരു ഒരു സംഭവം എനിക്ക് അവരുടെ വിദ്യാഭ്യാസ കാലത്ത് അവർ അതിനെ പറ്റി പറഞ്ഞ കാര്യങ്ങൾ അപ്പൊ എനിക്ക് ഡോക്ടേഴ്സിനോട് പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് പറയാനുള്ളത് നിങ്ങൾ ഒരു കൺവെൻഷണൽ ലെവൽ ഓഫ് ഡോക്ടേഴ്സ് ആയിട്ട് എപ്പോഴും നില കൊള്ളാതെ കൊണ്ട് നിങ്ങൾ എപ്പോഴും വ്യത്യസ്തമായിട്ടുള്ള സംവിധാനങ്ങളും അതുപോലെ പുതിയ തലമുറകളെ വ്യത്യസ്തമാക്കുന്ന സാഹചര്യങ്ങൾ നിങ്ങളായിട്ട് ഇപ്പോൾ മിഥിലേഷൊക്കെ എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞാൽ റാങ്ക് ഹോൾഡേഴ്സ് ആണ് റാങ്ക് ഹോൾഡേഴ്സ് ഈ ഒരു ഇതിനെ മാത്രം ഫോക്കസ് ചെയ്യാതെ കൊണ്ട് നിങ്ങൾ ഇതിനെ കൂടുതൽ എക്സ്പ്ലോയിറ്റ് ചെയ്യാനും അതുപോലെ നിങ്ങളുടെ നിങ്ങളുടെ ഈ ഡെൻറ്റിസ്ട്രിയിൽ തന്നെ നിങ്ങൾ റിസർച്ച് ഓറിയൻറ്റഡ് ആയിട്ട് പോകുന്ന പോകേണ്ട സാഹചര്യങ്ങളെ പറ്റി പഠിക്കാനും അതുപോലെ തന്നെ നിങ്ങൾ ഈ എല്ലാ ഡെൻറ്റിസ്റ്റുമാരെ മാതിരി ആവാതെ കൊണ്ട് നിങ്ങൾ ഈ ഷുഡ് സ്റ്റാൻഡ് സെപ്പറേറ്റ് മാറി വേറിട്ട് നിൽക്കുന്ന ഒരു സാഹചര്യത്തിലൂടെ അതാണ് ഞാൻ കണ്ട് മനസ്സിലാക്കുന്നത് ഇപ്പൊ ഡൽഹിയിലൊക്കെ മിഥിലേഷന് വലിയ വലിയ ഡെൻറ്റിസ്റ്റിനെ അന്വേഷിച്ചാൽ അറിയാൻ പറ്റും അവരൊക്കെ വേറിട്ട് നിൽക്കുന്നവരാണ് അങ്ങനെ വേറിട്ട് നിൽക്കുന്നത് കൊണ്ട് അവരുടെ പ്രാക്ടീസും അതുപോലെ തന്നെ അവരുടെ പേരും പ്രശസ്തി എല്ലാം വ്യത്യസ്തമാണ് അവർ വളരെ വളരെ വേറിട്ട് നിൽക്കുന്ന ഒരു സാഹചര്യങ്ങളാണ് ഏറ്റവും ലീഡിങ് ആയിട്ടുള്ള ഡൽഹിയിലുള്ള ഡെൻറ്റിസ്റ്റിനെയൊക്കെ നിങ്ങൾക്ക് കാണാൻ പറ്റും അപ്പൊ നിങ്ങൾ ഏത് മേഖലയിലാണെങ്കിലും നിങ്ങൾ ഒരു എന്താ പറയാ ആ മേഖലയിൽ നിങ്ങൾ മാക്സിമം അതിനെ എക്സ്പ്ലോയിറ്റ് ചെയ്യാനും അതുപോലെ തന്നെ അതിനകത്തൊരു അതിൽ ആ മേഖലയിൽ അതിനെ എക്സല് ചെയ്യുന്ന സാഹചര്യങ്ങൾ ഉണ്ടാക്കുകയും വേണമെന്നാണ് എനിക്ക് നിങ്ങളോട് എനിക്ക് പറയാനുള്ളത് അതാണ് അങ്ങനെ അതുകൊണ്ടാണ് ഞാൻ ഈ ഈ ഇന്ദിര നോയിയെ പറ്റി ഉള്ള ഒരു കാര്യം പറഞ്ഞ് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് വ്യത്യസ്തമായിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു ഒരു മേഖല നിങ്ങൾ നിങ്ങളിലൂടെ ഉണ്ടാക്കണം എന്ന് ഞാൻ പറയാൻ ഉദ്ദേശിച്ചത് അതുപോലെ തന്നെ ഉള്ള ഒരു കാര്യമാണ് എല്ലാ മരുന്നുകളും നേരത്തെ ഇവിടെ പറയുന്നുണ്ട് ട്രീറ്റ്മെന്റും മരുന്നുകളും എല്ലാം എല്ലാം നിങ്ങൾക്ക് കുപ്പിയിലോ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ടാബ്ലെറ്റ് ആയിട്ടോ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ വാക്സിനായിട്ടൊന്നും നിങ്ങൾക്ക് കൊടുക്കാൻ പറ്റൂല ഡോക്ടേഴ്സിനോ ഞാൻ എപ്പോഴും പറയും ഇതിൻ്റെ ഒരു പ്രത്യേകതയാണ് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് മരുന്നുകൾ എപ്പോഴും ടാബ്ലെറ്റോ അതുപോലെ ഇതിനെ കൂടുതൽ പഠിക്കാൻ ഈ ലേണിംഗ് ഇസ് എ നെവർ എൻഡിങ് പ്രോസസ് അതിങ്ങനെ നിങ്ങൾ പഠിച്ചോണ്ടേ ഇരിക്കണം ജീവിതം മുഴുവൻ പഠിച്ചുകൊണ്ടിരിക്കണം അപ്പോൾ ഇതിനെ ഈ മരുന്നുകൾ എന്ന് പറയുന്ന വ്യത്യസ്ത രീതികളിലാണ് ഡി ഡി ടോക്സിഫിക്കേഷൻ നിങ്ങൾ അതൊരു വലിയ മരുന്നാണ് ഡി ടോക്സിഫിക്കേഷൻ എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് അതിനെ നിങ്ങൾ എങ്ങനെയാണ് പ്രയോജനപ്പെടുത്താൻ പറ്റുക എന്നുള്ളത് നിങ്ങൾ മനസ്സിലാക്കുകയും അത് നിങ്ങളുടെ പേഷ്യൻറ്റിലേക്ക് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് പകർന്നു കൊടുക്കാനുള്ള ഒരു സാഹചര്യങ്ങൾ ഉണ്ടാക്കണം അതുപോലെ തന്നെയാണ് ക്വിറ്റിംഗ് ഓഫ് ജങ്ക് ഫുഡ് ഈ വേണ്ടാത്ത ഭക്ഷണങ്ങൾ അതൊക്കെ നിങ്ങളിലൂടെയാണ് നിങ്ങളുടെ അടുത്തേക്കാണ് ആളുകൾ വരുന്നത് അപ്പൊ നിങ്ങൾക്ക് അവരെയൊക്കെ നിങ്ങളെ നിങ്ങൾക്ക് എഡ്യൂക്കേറ്റ് ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റും അതുപോലെ തന്നെയാണ് എക്സസൈസ് അതും ഒരു മരുന്നാണ് നേച്ചർ നേച്ചർ ഇറ്റ് സെൽഫ് അതും വലിയ മരുന്നാണ് അതുപോലെ വെജിറ്റബിൾ ആൻഡ് ഫ്രൂട്ട്സ് വലിയ മരുന്നാണ് അതുപോലെ തന്നെ നിങ്ങൾ പേഷ്യൻസിന് കൊടുക്കേണ്ട ഏറ്റവും വലിയ അഡ്വൈസ് ആണ് ദ ഷുഡ് ഹാവ് എ സഫിഷ്യൻറ്റ് സ്ലീപ്പ് ഉറക്കം ഒരു വലിയൊരു മരുന്നാണെന്നുള്ളത് ഡോക്ടേഴ്സ് പേഷ്യൻസിനെ പറഞ്
അത് നിങ്ങൾ അതിനെ നിങ്ങൾ ഇത് കൊണ്ടുപോയി അത് നിങ്ങളിൽ ഉണ്ടാവണം എല്ല ഏതൊരു പേഷ്യൻ്റ് ആണെങ്കിലും അത് സാധാരണക്കാരനാണെങ്കിലും വളരെ പാവപ്പെട്ടവനാണെങ്കിലും നിവൃത്തിയില്ലാത്ത ബുദ്ധിമുട്ടുള്ള അവരെയൊക്കെ നിങ്ങൾ വളരെ ചേർത്ത് പിടിച്ച് ഒരു പേഷ്യൻറ്റിനെ ട്രീറ്റ് ചെയ്യുമ്പോൾ അവർ നിങ്ങൾ അനുകമ്പ ഉള്ളവരായി വേണം നിങ്ങൾ അവരോട് ട്രീറ്റ് ചെയ്യാനും അവരെ ഹാൻഡിൽ കൈകാര്യം ചെയ്യേണ്ടതും എന്നാണ് ഞാൻ എനിക്ക് നിങ്ങളോട് നിങ്ങളോട് പറയാനുള്ളത് എനിക്ക് തോന്നി കേൾക്കുന്നത് ഇതിനകത്ത് അതിമേ ഒരു നൂറോളം ഉണ്ട് ഇപ്പൊ കുറെ അറുപത് പേരുള്ളൂ എന്നാലും ഉള്ളവരോട് ഞാൻ പറയാണ് അതുപോലെ പ്രസന്റ് മോമെന്റ് അത് അതിനെ ആക്സെപ്റ്റ് ചെയ്യുക നമ്മളുടെ നിലവിലുള്ള സാധനം എന്താണോ അതിനെ ആക്സെപ്റ്റ് ചെയ്യുന്നുണ്ട് നമുക്ക് പോയാൽ പറ്റിയാൽ അതും നല്ലൊരു മെഡിസിൻ ആണ് ഈ അവസ്ഥയിൽ ഓർമ്മപ്പെടുത്തിക്കൊണ്ട് എൻ്റെ പ്രിയമുള്ള എൻ്റെ സ്വന്തം മക്കളാണ് എൻ്റെ എൻ്റെ ഈ പറഞ്ഞ ഇതിലേക്കുള്ള ആ ബാച്ച് മുതൽ എല്ലാ അലുമിനൈസും എനിക്ക് വളരെ വേണ്ടപ്പെട്ട ഇപ്പോഴുള്ള ബാച്ചുകളെ അത്തറിയാൻ എനിക്ക് ഒരു സാഹചര്യം എനിക്ക് എനിക്ക് മിഥിലേഷനെയൊക്കെ പറയുമ്പോൾ എനിക്ക് ആ വരാന്തക്കടയും കുസൃതിയൊക്കെ കാണിച്ച് നടക്കുന്ന മിഥിലേഷനെയാണ് എൻ്റെ മനസ്സിൽ പെട്ടെന്ന് വരുന്നത് ഏതായാലും ഇങ്ങനെയുള്ള ഇത്രയും വലിയൊരു പ്ലാറ്റ്ഫോമിൽ മിഥിലേഷനെ പോലെയുള്ളവരെയൊക്കെ എനിക്ക് കാണാൻ കറ്റിയതിലൊക്കെ വളരെ അത് എൻ്റെ ഹൃദയ അടി എൻ്റെ ഹൃദയത്തിൻ്റെ അടിത്തട്ടിൽ നിന്ന് വരുന്ന ആ ഒരു ഭാഷയാണ് വളരെയധികം സന്തോഷമുണ്ട് വളരെയധികം ചാരിതാർത്ഥ്യമുണ്ട് ഇനിയും നിങ്ങളിൽ എല്ലാവരും പ്രത്യേകിച്ചും അലുമിനൈസ് അന്നൂർ അലുമിനൈസ് എല്ലാവരും ഉയരങ്ങളിൽ ഉയരങ്ങളിൽ അത്യുന്നതങ്ങളിൽ എത്തട്ടെ എന്ന് സർവശക്തനോട് ആത്മാർത്ഥമായി പ്രാർത്ഥിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് എല്ലാ ഭാവങ്ങളും നേർന്നുകൊണ്ട് എല്ലാവർക്കും ഒരിക്കൽ കൂടി എല്ലാ ഭാവങ്ങളും നന്ദിയും പറഞ്ഞുകൊണ്ട് ഞാൻ എൻ്റെ വാക്കുകൾ അർപ്പിക്കുന്നു നന്ദി നമസ്കാരം Thank you, Anshana, for moderating the session. Uh, thank you, Anshana, as well as uh, thank you, Rashisa, for your uh, uh, valuable advice. And congrats, Midilish, uh, for a wonderful talk. Actually, uh, we are fortunate to have a wonderful student like you. First of all, I thank Anur Alumini Association for writing me for uh, this moderating for this session. And I will add some more points to what uh, he said. Uh, actually, what is the correct age uh, for uh, uh, removing that plastic food? I will explain that. And the correct age means, uh, usually uh, the patient is coming to you. Uh, you will think that uh, whether it is uh, indicated for removal or not. And uh, if you are trying to remove the truth, uh, in an old age it is like if you are trying to remove a glass piece from a concrete slab so the correct age for uh, removing that impacted tooth is 70 to 20 years because uh, after uh, tooth formation of tooth one third before uh, the tooth third formation of root is very difficult uh, easy uh, as he said uh, if you are trying to remove uh, the not warm tooth uh, the crown form tooth if you are elevating the tooth you will roll like a ball the same thing it is a roll like a ball and uh, the second and uh, the difficulty assessment why we have to uh, do the difficulty assessment because if you are not uh, assess the difficulty before doing that procedures uh, the complication is more complication will be more so if you are assessing the difficulty uh, then you can determine whether it will be removed under local anesthesia or general anesthesia as well as we can prepare the patient prepare the patient and manage the complication uh, so before doing any surgical procedure you have to take a basic uh, radio or basic investigation otherwise if you are uh, trying to remove for the without the radiograph you cannot assess if there is any pathology or any momentation uh, inside the bone so before doing advice before doing any surgical removal of impacted tooth you have to take an x-ray x-ray then there are 13 golden rules 13 steps 
uh, for surgical and molecular impacted tooth. If you are following the 13 or 13 steps, you can minimize the complication. The first one is sepsis isolation. If you are isolating that area and sterile field, the complication will be more. Then the second step one is anesthesia. If it is difficult, if you are thinking that is very difficult, you can prefer general anesthesia. Never try with under local anesthesia. Then the flat design. If it is a proper flat design, uh, you can close the wound. You can minimize the complication. Then uh, the next step is the fourth one is the reflection of mucoperiosteal flap. Sometimes you will reflect the mucoperiosteal, but the mucus may flap. And you should uh, insert that periosteum also, you reflect the mucoperiosteum. Then the bone removal. Bone removal, while bone removing that bone, if you are not uh, uh, irrigating that, yeah, there will be thermal trauma. Then sectioning the tooth, elevation. While elevating the tooth, you have to support the adjacent tooth. Otherwise, elevating the tooth, the, the neighboring tooth will also come out. It will pop out like an orange seed. So while elevating the tooth, you should have support the adjacent tooth. Then extraction, then deep baby then. Uh, closing the wound, deep right that area, opening the wound, control the bleeding. There are so many techniques to control the bleeding. Then close. Then you have to recall the patient on third day. Third day. Remember that if any extraction you are doing, extraction or surgical removal, recall the patient on third day. Because if there is massive swelling or hematoma, if you are evacuating the hematoma, remove the sutures and evacuating, evacuating hematoma. Then uh, the such swelling will subside. Infection, it, there will be no infection after that. So if you are not removing or evacuating the hematoma, there's a chance for liquefying the hematoma and it will lead to space infection. So before uh, that, you have to recall the patient on third. Then if there is no swelling or uh, any infection, recaution on seventh day. These are the 13 steps for uh, surgical removal. If you're following these 13 rules, the complication will uh, minimize. Then next to the remember then, while uh, putting the incision, never extend the incision to the lingual side. You uh, read the posterior incision, you should reflect, uh, extend to the buccal side. Because if you are extending the incision to lingual side, the cha chance for damaging the lingual nerve, the lingual nerve is passing uh, around three to eight mil away from the, uh, the gingival margin. So there's a chance for damaging the lingual nerve. As well as if you are extending the incision too far upward, there's a chance for herniation of buccal branch. Then the incision affecting the anterior fibers of uh, temporalis muscle, it will lead to post-operative Christmas. So never extend the incision too far upward. Then one more complication is here, if you are extending that incision too far upward, there's a chance of cutting the uh, long buccal artery. There is a small artery passing along with the long buccal nerve. If you are extending that incision too far upward, there's a chance for cutting that uh, long buccal artery. There will be bleeding. And uh, Suppose if general practitioners are trying to remove the impacted tooth with uh, air rotor, never use air rotor because there is a chance for air emphysema. You prefer micro rotor, never use air rotor because the uh, air emphysema is very painful and it will take long time to subside the um, air emphysema. As well as remember that if you want to elevate the tooth, never elevate the tooth in lingual side because the lingual plate is very thin. And if you are elevating the tooth in lingual side, there's a chance for fracture of lingual, lingual plate. And as the myeloid muscle is attaching on the, that area, the muscle, because of the muscle pull, the bone will expand. There's a chance for pushing the tooth into the lingual pouch or maulia hyoid space. So if you want to remove or elevate the tooth, never try to elevate the tooth to lingual side because it will push into the lingual.
pouch. So if it is pushed into the lingual pouch, it's very difficult to retrieve. And it is very, very difficult. Yeah. Otherwise, you can refer the patient to oral surgeon. They will remove through the extra oral approach. So that while elevating the tooth, never elevate the tooth to lingual size. Then uh, you can expect some condition. All the surgical procedure, procedures having complications. You can expect the complication before doing. If you are anticipating the patient, you can minimize the swelling, the bleeding, and other complications. And immediate, what are the immediate post-operative complication? The patient will recall calling you back within 24 hours to 48 hours with complaint of pain. The pain is the main problem. If you are given proper analgesics, the analgesics uh, we can the, 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 uh, the pain will subside, and sometimes patient will call you back with the bleeding. If it is a mild oozing, uh, and twenty-four, it will subside, and if it is more swelling, uh, it will subside. And the hematoma, if it is a large hematoma, you have to evacuate the hematoma because the hematoma will act like it's a good uh, medium for uh, microorganism growth. So we call the patient on third day. You switch, you remove the switch, you work with the hematoma. And uh, if you are not, uh, as I said, if you are not uh, evacuating the hematoma, there's a chance for liquefying the hematoma, it will lead to space infection, space infection. Then another complication, like after two or three days, uh, the patient will complain of swelling, then a mild pain. So Christmas is one of the major complications. And uh, uh, the only thing is, the facilitated jaw opening, that is uh, the jaw exercise. That is the only uh, third to uh, uh, rectify the trismus. Then if there's any infant, you can give proper antibiotics and uh, incision and drainage. If was abscess is there, you can incision and drainage. And sometimes patient will uh, come back with the dry soap, dry soap hit, and uh, the irrigation zinc oxide pack is a bit uh, um, solving the problem. Then the patient will complain of paresthesia of the lingual side and the half part of the tongue. That is the major problem. Then uh, uh, suppose if lingual damage is there or inferior alveolar damage is there, if it is neuropraxia, the sensation will come back. If it is nerve cut, inform the patient. Sometimes the, per the persistent kind of paresthesia will be there. The only thing, do sensory mapping and observe the improvement. That is the only thing. Then, thank you, Midilesh. Uh, you say a wonderful talk. And uh, all people like our, our own children. And uh, we will see in a, in a high uh, in the future. And all the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Eldosa, for moderating the session. So we have one uh, question popped in the chat box. May I read it, sir? Sir, what is the criteria to decide whether the opposing third molar needs to be extracted or not? Uh, the better thing, uh, uh, suppose uh, the third molar, upper third molar, if you remove the uh, lower third molar, better you remove uh, upper one also because there's a chance for supra eruption in future. Supra eruption in future. And in a single stage, if you are removing the complication, will be other in you are removing the second stage, uh, it is inconvenient for the patient. Better thing, remove if you are removing the uh, impact that molar, remove the upper one also because there's a chance of superaction and it will impinge the lower uh, the chronic irritation as well as uh, chronic uh, abscess, abscess, sorry. The, the, Chronic uh, ulceration will be there. So better remove the wrapper one also. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. That was a very informative session indeed. Thank you so much, Dr. Elgos, sir. Gratitude is the fairest blossom that springs from the soul. As we come to the conclusion of the program, may I now invite Dr. Sebi George to propose the vote of thanks. Good evening all. This was really a fruitful session. I am extremely happy to hear such a wonderful session from by our doc Dr. Mithilesh. 
my old student on this auspicious occasion on behalf of the annual dental college uh, staff students and alumni i extend my sincere thanks to our administrative chairman advocate ts rashid sir and the vibrant director mr ts benjamin sir for being a constant support and source of encouragement in all ventures of the college i thank our principal dr jiju george baby who is a passionate and dedicated teacher and has been always the guiding spirit in conducting programs like this let me thank our charming vice principal dr lisa george and our students team professor and head of the department of periodontics dr josh bold for supporting in all our academic activities it's a joy to thank our president of alumni association dr deepak thomas and secretary dr ronit sebastian for being pillars to this association i <coughs> take this opportunity to thank the speaker of the day dr midilesh kadanthod for delivering an excellent speech this outstanding session is indeed going to be a useful going to be useful for all who have attended this session i would like to thank the hod uh, department of oral and maxillofacial surgery dr eldos george for the med for mediating this session thank you sir i also extend my sincere thanks to all the hod's doctors teaching staff and non teaching staff of the college for their valuable support i thank each and every one who has given their presence hence to make this program a grand success expecting more and more informative sessions in the future from our alumni association thank you thank you so much sevi ma'am the ending of a story is a new beginning for many others on this note let's conclude a remarkable memorable and a knowledgeable session on behalf of the institution we sincerely thank the dignitaries for being here with us this evening and enlightening us with their enthusiastic remarks a sincere gratitude also extends to the annur alumni association for wholeheartedly supporting us and rendering their support for the success of this program we annu together is moving as a family so there's a small request from our side to the alumni to inform us regarding any accolades or any special dates including birthdays to the association thank you so much everyone and here's dr jesslyn and dr anjana signing off have a very fun filled and a wonderful evening thank you once again <laughs>